Let us open God's Word together to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4. We'll look at verses 6 through 10 this morning. 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6. I'll read the text, but I want you to keep it open. As usual, we study through the Scriptures together, and I want you to be able to see that what I'm saying to you is reflected here in the Scripture. So I'm going to read it, I'm going to pray for us, and hopefully you'll just continue to have your Bible open and follow along as we teach. So this is the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, who's the pastor of the church at Ephesus, and he's writing under the inspiration of the Spirit of God when he says this, If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy, and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hopes set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. This is God's Word. Would you pray with me before we study it together? Father, thank you. Thank you for your Word. Thank you for this gathering. Thank you for the songs that we get to sing and the truths that we get to declare, both to you and to one another. Thank you for the supper, this tangible reminder of your promise, of your work to make us your own. And now as we open your word and we study your word, as we continue to worship, I pray that our hearts and our minds would be attuned to the scriptures. Let your spirit move among us to fix and focus our hearts where they need to be. And I pray that you would confront us where we need to be confronted this morning. As we look at this example in Timothy and this encouragement from Paul for Timothy to be a good servant of Christ, let us see instruction for our lives as believers in Christ on how we can be faithful in our service to you. So would you accomplish your purpose now in the preaching of your word to your people? I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, like Mark said, I want to wish you a a happy new year. I hope that... uh, The first seven days of 2024 have been good to you, but I'm wondering how you're all doing on the New Year's resolutions you made. Seven days in, surely we've got things we're trying to improve on. That's just what we do this time of year, right? This time of year, we resolve to do better. We resolve to work harder, to give more, to love more, to be present more, to be more helpful And much of our desire to improve is based upon looking back on the last year. We look on the year that's passed, and we think, how can we do better in the year that is to come? Just a common thing. It's a cultural thing. It's what we do. It's a very natural thing for us to try to improve, to do better. Self-evaluation. It can be a very good thing where we can see areas of our lives where we need to improve. Maybe you want to get in shape. Maybe you want to spend more time with your family. Maybe you want to strengthen certain relationships. Maybe you want to spend more time in the Word of God. You want to read Scripture. Maybe you want to memorize Scripture. All of these areas of self-evaluation can lead to good in our lives. But, But I do want to caution you. There is a reason for us to be careful when we focus our energy and our attention on our own self improvement We need to be careful when we look at certain areas of our lives where we've fallen short and then making these white-knuckled resolutions to just do better. And the reason I say this about making resolutions is because making a resolution to change without first addressing the need of repentance is not a biblical approach to self-improvement. There are many areas of our lives where we need to grow. Many areas of our lives where we've neglected the Word of God. 
And so I'm not trying to step on toes here, but here's the reality. If losing weight is your resolution, then maybe there's a need to confess the sin of gluttony. If getting in shape is the resolution, maybe there's a need to confess the sin of sloth and laziness. If getting back into church is the resolution, maybe you need to confess the sin that drove you away in the first place. You see, as Christians, we don't just white-knuckle our way through life. We run back to Christ. We confess our sins to Him who is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. And then we seek His help, strength, and guidance as we go forward to do better for His glory. Self-evaluation can be great, but we need to do it in the right way. Where we have sinned, we need to confess our sin, pray for mercy, and then begin to grow in faithfulness to Christ. And I, my guess is, if we'll do that in 2024, if we'll look at our lives through the lens of the gospel in 2024, our self-evaluation might go a bit different. Perhaps we'll begin to look at our jobs and not just think, how can I improve? How can I climb the ladder? But we'll look at our jobs as an opportunity to make much of Christ and maybe share the gospel with our coworkers. Rather than just looking at better opportunities to spend time with our family and planning great vacations, we can resolve in God's grace to lead our wives and children into a deeper understanding of God's Word. And maybe we can see growth, not just in our personal improvement, but growth in our spiritual maturity. That's my hope. That's what I'm talking about. I'm saying that the greatest concern for us at this time of year ought not to simply be how we can improve, but how we can more faithfully honor Christ in our life. As we look back over the recent past and evaluate where we are at the present, the question that matters the most is how should the gospel affect our future? And that's what Paul's concerned about here in this letter. He's writing to Timothy. He's not trying to shift the church's strategy away from the truth. He's trying to help Timothy realign the church with the gospel and the truth of God's word. He's trying to refocus the church's ministry on a gospel foundation. That's what we've been studying for the last 13, 14 weeks. And now, today, in our text this morning, he tells Timothy, hey, if you want to be a good servant of Christ... Here are the things that you must be faithful to do. So let's look at these. There's five of them. And I'll start by pointing this out. Let's, number one, resolve to be a good servant of Christ. Look back at verse 6. He says, if you put these things before the brothers, and you could include the word brothers and sisters there, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. So we understand this, or at least if, if you don't, you need to understand this. To be a, a good servant of Christ is the aim of the Christian life. The aim of the Christian life is not to walk down an aisle, pray a prayer, I'm good, I can sit in the pew for the rest of my life and never grow. That's not the aim of the Christian life. The aim of the Christian life is to come to Jesus, receive the gospel with the empty hands of faith, and then grow and mature to be more like him in the way that we live, in the way that we love, and in the way that we serve. We want to be good servants of Christ. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He came not to be served, but to serve. He came to shine the light of His grace and truth into the darkness of our sin and misery. He came to rescue us. He came to find us. He came to call us out of the world so that we can deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow Him. That's the aim, following Him, becoming more and more like him, which means that as believers, our lives are to be shaped and motivated by what he's done for us, by the good news. And our goal is not friendship with the world. That's a constant temptation for us, but that's not the goal. Our goal is to be faithful to our Savior. And, and Timothy hears some words from Paul. He, he says that our aim is to be a good servant. And the term good here, it, it can be translated as useful. Excellent, available, be a useful servant. And the term servant here is the same word that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, diakonos. It's the same word we get our term deacon from. Only he's not using it here to refer to the office of a deacon. He's just talking about the fact that we're all supposed to be servants. So when you put this together, he is saying this. If you want to be a good servant of Christ, you need to be useful in your service to one another for the sake of Christ. 
Our aim is to be useful, faithful servants of Christ. And this doesn't happen by accident. You don't just stumble into that. It requires us to be faithful. It requires our hearts to be filled with the love of Christ, our minds to be filled with the truth of Christ, and our will to be committed to actively serving Christ. It's a whole body approach to the Christian life. How can I be a faithful servant? And in Timothy's case, his service to the Lord is marked by his willingness to put the truth before his brothers and sisters. That's what he says here. If you put these things before the brothers, you'll be a good servant. And that these things there is everything we've been studying prior to this passage, right? So all of the instruction that he's been giving on prayer and on confronting false teaching and being faithful to the Lord to order the church a certain way and to appoint elders and deacons according to uh, the characterization and the qualifications that are there, all of these things, if you put those before the brothers, you'll be doing a useful service to Christ. That's what he's saying. And Paul actually uses an interesting phrase when he says to put these things before. It, it could literally be translated, lay these things out before the brothers. And the term, it's often used in, in construction terminology of a foundation. He's saying, lay a foundation for the brothers and sisters to understand how they can build their lives upon this. Timothy serves Christ by preaching. He uses his gifts and, and boldness to proclaim the truth, to confront error, to, to feed the sheep. He's a pastor. He's a preacher. His service is marked by his gifts and his calling. And so here's the, the question that is begging. What are your gifts? How has the Lord gifted you? And how are you using those gifts to serve the body and the brothers and sisters at Cornerstone? What calling has the Lord placed on your life? How are you using the things that the Lord has equipped you to do, the burdens and passions that you have? How are you using those to serve the body and the Lord? Look, it's easy in a church that's filled with mature and faithful Christians. It's easy in a place like this to just be content to sit back and let others do the work. It really is. It's wonderful to be able to go into a Sunday school class and, and have you know, a PhD teaching us, which we do. It's wonderful to have very experienced elders who are not only experienced in ministry, but also experienced in education. They are sharp and very capable. It's wonderful to have people that have done this for years. They know what they're doing and they can jump in and serve, but that's not what we're being called to here. All of us are being called to be faithful, useful servants of Christ Jesus. So don't neglect the gifts that the Lord has given to you. Resolve to be a good servant of Christ. Make it your aim this year to serve the needs of those around you. That's not all he tells us about being a good servant of Christ. In, in, at the end of verse 6, he says that a good servant is both a student of Scripture and Doctrine, he says, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. It's again a basic concept for us as Christians that we are to be growing and maturing in the faith. And if we think about Timothy's life, we know this about Timothy. Timothy learned the faith, he learned the truth of God's word from his mother and his grandmother. And then we, we learn in the book of Acts that Paul came along, Paul saw Timothy, recognized his giftedness, recognized his spiritual maturity, thanked his mother and grandmother, and then Paul took Timothy aside and, and trained him for ministry in the church. Paul took him on a crash course in church planting, right? That's, that was Timothy's being trained. But Bible study and theology is not just the work of church planters. It's not just the work of pastors. It's not just the work of, of preachers. In Timothy's case, studying the scriptures and teaching it was the work of his mother and his grandmother. So moms and grandmoms, this is your job. Fathers, it is your responsibility to know the truth to study the scriptures and doctrine, and to train your children in that, to bring them up in the fear and instruction of the Lord. It is your job. It is your responsibility. We all have a responsibility in this. It is the work of every Christian to know the truth and to be about the task of making disciples. 
So if you're a believer in Christ, you should be a student both of Scripture and doctrine. That's what he says here. He was trained in the words of the faith, which is kind of this euphemism for the the truth of the gospel. So he's being trained in the faith that is relating to Christ, but also in the good doctrine that you have followed. We should be a student of both of these things. And Paul tells Timothy here, he says that that phrase, have been trained or being trained in, um, it's a term that is generally translated as nourished. It's a, it's a term that is often used to describe a mother feeding uh, and rearing a child. So it, it's also in the present tense. And what that means is that it could be translated this way, being continually nourished upon the words of the faith and the good doctrine that you have followed. So let me put that into at least some sense of context here. Timothy was well trained by his mom and his grandmother. Timothy was well trained by the Apostle Paul. And it might have been a temptation for him to not go back to the Scriptures, to not think deeply about doctrine, but just to rely on on what he learned as a child. Just to kind of resort back to, yeah, I learned these lessons and that's enough. He could have just drawn on the lessons from his childhood, but Paul says, no, don't do that. Keep studying. Continually be nourished by the Word of God and doctrine. So some of you have been in the church for a long time. You professed faith when you were young and you learned good things and and you're kind of relying upon that and your spiritual maturity is stunted because you haven't grown to this point of continually devoting yourself to the Word of God and doctrine. And that's what being a good servant, being a useful, faithful, growing servant requires. So brothers and sisters, resolve to be students of the Word. Resolve to read and study God's Word so that you can nourish your own soul, but then also be able to teach it to others. So what does that look like? Maybe it's just as simple as this. Make a point. If you haven't already, make a point to spend the year reading through the Bible. And not just reading it to get from A to B, but reading it to learn. And if you get stuck on a verse and you need to think on it and you need to look it up or you need to ask somebody about it, then stick with that verse and meditate on it and marinate in it and learn all you can about what it means. It also means not only should should you be reading the scriptures this year, but you should also pick up a good book. Don't raise your hand, but when's the last time you read a good book, a specific book devoted to explaining a challenging doctrine of the faith? It's not something we do all the time. Some of us do, but not everyone. If you've never read a good book, there are some Christian classics that you should should pick up and read. There are some wonderful books in our library, and you might have to blow the dust off of them when you pick them up because nobody's checked them out in a while. Rush to the library and find a good book. Maybe you're thinking on something. Maybe there's a doctrinal question that you have. Maybe there's an issue in your life. They're they're categorized in there. Mark Ritchie has done a wonderful job, and he's had a lot of help from different people to organize our library so that it can be helpful to you, so that you can grow and mature. Run to the library. Find a good book. And if you you struggle with accountability, then find one of the men and women or women that's sitting around you and say, hey, can we read a book together? I can't even begin to tell you how much of discipleship ministry happens in this church by doing just that. An elder with, a, with an individual in the congregation that needs to grow in a certain way, and we meet together regularly and we read a book together. So resolve to study God's Word. Resolve to read a good book so that you can be constantly nourished on the words of the faith and the good doctrine. None of us knows what's in store for the year that is to come. <laughs> None of us knows what's going to happen. None of us knows. We've got some designs and ideas, but none of us knows, but we should all make it a point to be prepared. There may be a need for new teachers. Will you be ready to step into that role? There will certainly be a need for new home group leaders. Will you be ready to step into that role? There may be needs within this congregation that none of us knows about. My question is, will you be a 
good servant of Christ, a useful servant of Christ who's committed to growing and being nourished in the faith so that you will be ready to step in and serve. We all need to do our best to present ourselves to God as those approved workers who have no need to be ashamed because we rightly handle the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. The third way that we can be disciplined in our service to the Lord is that a good servant avoids worldly teaching. Look at verse 7 there. He says, have nothing to do with irreverent and silly myths. The actual language there is old wives' tales, but I like the way that the, the ESV has translated this out as silly myths. It's very easy, isn't it, to get entangled in all the new ideas and the new fads that this world throws at us. It's really easy, whether it's through your social media or it's just the news media, it's very easy to get entangled in this new thing that's come out and start thinking about it, start researching it, and just get, go do a deep dive on it. It's like dropping a leaf into a flowing stream. It, you easily get carried away. And the stream of new ideas flowing through our culture seems to be never-ending. And sadly, the church seems to be eager to get swept away with every new controversy and every new wind of doctrine. And what Paul says to Timothy is, don't devote a couple of hours to this. He says, avoid it completely. He says, have nothing to do with this. Don't become an expert in the silly myths that are being thrown around in the culture have nothing to do with all of this stuff. And that means some of the stuff that shows up in your news feed, you should have nothing to do with it. Stay clear of all the unnecessary controversies that flood the internet. In Timothy's case, the stuff that he needed to avoid, the things that he needed to not get caught up in, are, he, Paul's likely talking about the false teaching that's going on, the controversial ideas that were being addressed through this letter. And, and I don't think that Paul wants him to avoid it in the sense that he should act as though it's not a reality. But to avoid getting entangled in it personally. See, Timothy needed to know what was being taught so that he could address it with Scripture. But, but Paul says, make sure that you don't get so entangled in this stuff that it carries you away into vain discussions that will lead your heart and your mind away from the truth. You know, some ideas in our culture are so illogical, they're so unbiblical that they are easy to spot. But there are some ideas that catch our attention, and before we know it, we have wasted hours or even days probing into godless ideas. And yes, I have in my mind a lot of the social media that we just get glued to. Maybe you need to take a break from it. We're having a conversation in prayer meeting about moving our social media aside. I, I dropped off of all social media in 2012. Not a single regret. I'm not saying that you should do that. Some of you use it as a really good tool to stay connected to friends and stay involved in ministry to others. I'm not saying that, but it is a tool that can easily lead our hearts away from the truth. And we need to be discerning, and some of us need to avoid it entirely. Don't become an expert in all things false. Don't become an expert in all things cultural entertainment. Don't give your time and energy to worldly teaching. But rather, Paul says, train yourself for godliness. That's the fourth step of discipline here, that a good servant trains themselves for godliness. Look back at the end of verse 7. He says, rather, instead of devoting yourself to these myths, rather train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Now, this is the third trustworthy statement that we've seen from the Apostle Paul in this book so far. And generally speaking, he will say, this is a trustworthy statement, and then he'll state it out. I think in this case, it's in the reverse. He's already given us the trustworthy statement. And the trustworthy statement is that training yourself for godliness holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The language of these verses is aimed at painting a picture 
in our minds of putting forth effort and, and in a specific way. The verb he uses here for train yourself is the word gymnazo, which is the root of our English word for gymnasium. Right? I mean, that's, we, we, we have a picture in our mind, right, of a gymnasium. Now, maybe you're thinking of a, a high school gymnasium and the smelly locker rooms and all that kind of stuff. That's not exactly the same picture that he has here. But, but we know what a gymnasium is for. At least we should. What do you do in a gymnasium? You train your body. In a gymnasium, you exercise. And every Greek city would have had a gymnasium, especially the city of Ephesus, which is where this letter is written. And young people, specifically young men, were expected to spend much of their time in their teenage years honing their body, training at the gym, training themselves for physical activity. Because the Greeks and the Romans, they placed a really high priority on physical fitness. And not only that, but there was also this thing called the Olympic Games. And, and for individuals who were really expert in all of these different games and all these different fields, they might have an opportunity to achieve Olympic glory. And so for, from a cultural standpoint, Paul is saying, you know how this works, right? You understand how people put all this effort into the gymnasium. They, they seek their own personal glory. They, they seek physical fitness and they want to strive and they put this effort forth. And he's saying, that has some value. But training yourself for godliness has an even greater value. Now, I doubt that many of you are seeking to achieve Olympic glory. I may be wrong. But I am sure that we all know what is required if you really want to get in shape. Like, if, if you wanted to physically get yourself into shape, you know what's, what's required, right? You're going to have to change your diet. You're going to stop eating carbs. You're going to have to eat protein. You're going to have to eat more healthy. You're going to have to eat the things that fuel your muscles and feed your body so that you can get the most out of it. You're going to have to increase your physical activity. You're going to have to start slow, but you're going to have to work hard, right? You're going to gain strength and endurance over time. You're going to have to get over the soreness of all of that. Some of you are doing that right now. But, but you know what is required. You know that you're going to have to set goals, and then you're going to have to work hard on a daily basis to achieve those goals. We know that getting into shape will require discipline. It will require us to say no to some things in order to say yes to other things in order to achieve the goals that we've set. And look, right now, the diet and the exercise industry is coming after you with both barrels. It is one of the most lucrative industries in our country. And, and the diet industry is all geared around the fact that we're going to take that hard work that is required to get in shape and we're going to make it easy for you. But we all know it's not easy. There's nothing easy about it. It requires an insane level of sacrifice and hard work and accountability and commitment. It requires discipline. And here's, here's the thought. Should we expect anything less if we're going to get ourselves into shape spiritually? If we're going to really, truly train ourselves for godliness, it will require that we adjust our diet. It's going to require that rather, being, rather than being constantly nourished on entertainment and worldly ideas, we're going to discipline ourselves to be trained and nourished by the Word. I doubt that our televisions are in jeopardy of the off button being worn out. Maybe they should. In order for us to grow in godliness, we're going to have to increase our spiritual exercise. By starting a Bible reading plan, by reading a good book, by regularly attending a home group, by committing to in, in involving yourself in the life of the church in a way that you haven't to this point. We're going to have to set goals for the year and assess our progress each week and each month so that we can stay on track. You're going to have to discipline yourself and seek the accountability necessary to stay on course. To grow and mature spiritually is going to take hard work. But Paul says here, it is well worth the effort because the reward is double what you gain in bodily training. Bodily training has some value. It leads to health, increased energy, a feeling of accomplishment. It makes you look better, but training in godliness leads to a greater reward. It strengthens your soul. 
It increases and nourishes your faith. It makes us useful to Christ and to other people. It holds deep spiritual value for this life and an assured confidence for the life that is to come. So brothers and sisters, resolve to train yourself in 2024 in the pursuit of godliness. And then number five, a good servant toils and strives with their hope set on the living God. That's verse 10. For to this end we toil and strive because we have set our hope on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. The words toil and strive, well, that sounds delightful, doesn't it? Toil and strive. He's talking about putting forth effort. It's not going to happen easily. It's not going to happen while you sleep. You're going to have to put forth effort in order to grow. But it's an effort that is motivated by a hope that is set on the Lord. Then going back to some of the gospel principles that we've been saying here, we don't toil and strive in order to earn our salvation. That's what the Pharisees believed. And many in our culture believe that's the case today, that the gospel is in some way to be understood as if we do all of these things, then God will love us. That's not the gospel of Scripture. The gospel of Scripture is that God has revealed His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, He sent His Son to die in our place. And we come to Him with empty hands. We don't come to Him offering all the reasons why He should accept us. We come... And we receive the gift of his salvation. And on the other end of that, with a deeper understanding of the love that has saved us, we toil and strive to honor the one who has saved us. That's what we're after here. That's what he's talking about here. We have not set our hope on ourselves. We've set our hope on the living God. And therefore, we toil and we strive in the pursuit of godliness. Our hope is not that our Physical prowess will reward us with earthly glory. Our hope is not set on the passions and pleasures that this life affords. Our hope is is set on the living God. Our confidence is in Him, not this world, not this flesh. Our hope is not set on our happiness. Our hope is set on the living God. In John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus was talking to the disciples and He said, a very sobering thing. He said, in this world you will have tribulation. Some, some of our Bibles translate it trouble. In this world you will have trouble. And some of you can just sit back and say, yeah, I've, I've experienced a little bit of that. In this world you will have tribulation. Jesus is not pulling the wool over our eyes. He is telling us exactly what to expect. In this world you will have tribulation. But then he says this. He says, but take heart. Let your heart be renewed. Find strength in your heart because of this. I have overcome the world. There are worries in this life that simply do not go away because we want them to. There are troubles and tribulations in life that require deeper solutions than physical fitness or materialistic happiness. And no one understood this more than Jesus. And in John 16, he makes a clear statement of fact when he speaks to us. And he says, in this world you will have trouble. Trouble is certain. But in the face of worldly trouble, we take heart. Not because we have overcome the world by our happiness. But because Jesus has overcome the world in our stead. That is where our hope truly lies. In Christ, who has conquered death and freed us from the empty hope that this world offers. And that's why we call him our Savior. He has saved us from the siren song of this world to give us a hope and a future that is out of this world. And he is the hope that this whole world needs. His saving love is extended to all, but it's realized only by those who believe. So I don't know where you are this morning. I don't know where you're coming from in terms of where your mind was regarding resolutions and all that. My guess is that everyone has come in here with the belief at some level that the problems with my life that need to change are outside of myself. And the gospel says, no, ultimately the deepest, most important problems that need to change are the ones that we bring to the table. They're the ones in our hearts, which is why we need Christ so much. And why we need to set our hope not on ourselves, but on Him. 
The cross of Christ declares that what we need is to be saved from sin and reconciled to God. The gospel says that hope in this life is only a pitiful hope. But the hope that Christ gives is an eternal hope. The only way for that hope to become a reality for you, the only way for you to have this lasting peace that will motivate you to pursue being a good servant of Christ is if you come to Jesus and you receive him. The gospel represents a complete overthrow of the value system of this world. It reshapes our hearts and our entire lives. So before you put all of your New Year energy into resolutions, examine yourself in light of the cross. Where you see sin, confess it before God and come to Christ for forgiveness and for cleansing. And where you see worldly ambition, repent and fix your hope on the Lord, not the world. And where you have made spirituality a personal thing, I pray the Lord will open your heart and let you see that you need a lot more help than you think. From Him and also from His people. And where you need encouragement and accountability, look around you. And open your life up to your brothers and sisters in Christ who are eager to help bear your burden alongside you. So my prayer, my hope for us in this new year is that 2024 would be a year where we resolve to be good servants of Christ, to fill our minds with his truth, to train ourselves for the purpose of godliness, to seek the glory of Christ, even though it costs us. Let me pray that that would become our heart's desire. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this passage. Thank you for this encouragement from the Apostle Paul to Timothy and to us. And I pray that with, with all of the thoughts going through our minds and all of the motivations that are swirling around in our lives, Father, that you would fix us upon the gospel realities. That that would become the most pressing thing in our minds and in our lives. Father, help us to repent where we need to repent and help us to grow to be more like Christ. You welcome us. You, you tell us to come. If we have a, a, a burden that is heavy, you say come because your burden is light. And so, Father, would you allow us to have that motivation and desire to come to you, to seek you, to grow in you, and to be a good servant? Would you fix in our hearts and minds a plan for how we can grow? And let us toil and strive to that end with our hope fixed on you. So, Lord, accomplish your purpose in us. And let this year be a year of growth and maturity and service where we give you glory and we reap the benefits here on this, this earth together as a people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.